Robin, I'd love to orientate us just a little bit by hearing an aspect of the land that really shaped you when you were growing up. Um, and also maybe perhaps you'd like to call in a certain being, a certain species into this session and who knows, they might pop up in, in mysterious ways. Sure, well, I, it's nice to be here with all of you today. Um, I am experiencing joy seeing your faces. Even though we're not in the same room together, there's a, you know, I, I feel the presence together. And so it's, it's, uh, it's bringing me some, some joy and some warmth in my heart to be here with all of you. And to answer the question of, you know, the land where I was born and the land that raised me and the land that is me, that's a the challenging aspect of that is that it's hard for me to answer that without talking for about a half hour. <laughs> um, the land that raised me is a place that I have a very, very deep connection to. And I'm so grateful for that because I know a lot of us don't really have a, a deep connection to the land that we are from. And, you know, that's this colonizer mindset and this disconnected uh, dominator mindset is to disconnect us from the land. And so, so many of my peers and my colleagues and um, friends are, they don't really have a story of the connection to their land. And especially amongst white cultures, I feel like it's been lost the most, um, these modern cultures. And, but for me, I grew up on Lake Superior and it's uh, Lake Superior, even though I'm not there at this moment, I still feel that the water of Lake Superior courses through my veins. When I am there, the water is absolutely coursing through my veins because I am drinking the water, I'm swimming in the water, I'm eating food that has the water of Lake Superior in it. And so I can say that literally the water of uh, Lake Superior courses through my veins. But when I'm not there, it still does because it's in my DNA. You know, the first 19 years of my life, that, that, that Lake Superior water was pumping through my body. And I am certain that it is within my DNA. And so I grew up uh, every moment, moment that I had, I was catching turtles and frogs and going fishing. So no one particular animal um, you know, no one particular animal, but it would be all, all creatures that swim would be what is calling to me in this moment. And um, that would include leopard frogs, wood frogs, uh, painted turtles, and um, I would say rainbow trout, brook trout, brown trout, and uh, the coho salmon would be some of the creatures that most uh, arise in my mind at the moment. Oh, thank you. I loved how watery that was since we're in the moon of water, water of life on this, on this course. And yeah, it's been a deep exploration of how we are, the waters that we, where we inhabit. And um, I love that extra piece of where, yeah, we are fundamentally perhaps the, the waters very much woven into our DNA and perhaps even we become more a certain river the longer we live through the generations with that particular river and who's to say that it's not the river that's dreaming through us. Um, so thank you, I love that and I'll just share some other um, flora and fauna who wanted to come into the space, daffodil, more wild garlic, cherry, cherry blossom, um, tulips are trying to sprout through the snow, mangoes also, uh, tulips in the Netherlands, woodenomi, lesser, calendine, butterbur, I hope I said those right, I'm not familiar with those ones, that's beautiful. Yeah, thank you everyone, that's really gorgeous. Um, and thank you Robin for that introduction, it's lovely to get a sense of the water body that you are coming into this space. So I will hand to you then. <laughs> All right. Thanks for being here, everyone. Beautiful to see lots of faces and really great to, to see Robin's face here. And I'm particularly excited to see the, your, uh, your clothes that I've spent quite a lot of time reading about in the last year. I've been following 
Robin's work for, for quite a long time now and it's been just a really beautiful and very inspiring trajectory um, watching someone really really just embody and lean into what they believe uh, are the things that, that need to happen in the world and yeah just really honoring Robin for, for that journey I'm, I myself know how hard it can be to relinquish a lot of the the attachments of, uh, of what are offered to us at the minute mm -hmm. and so yeah Robin feels like a really beautiful guest to have on uh, for a, a range of reasons and hopefully we can explore a few of those so yeah I'd love just to hear your own introduction Robin in the, in the way that feels good to you how you would like to introduce yourself um, and then we sure. can fire into some questions yeah very happy to um, well thanks for sharing your feedback and how my life has been meaningful and uh, beneficial to you that's why I do what I do and so that's the motivation that keeps me going so what got me started was in 2011, I was living a pretty typical U.S. American lifestyle. I was very focused on material possessions and financial wealth. Uh, my car was central to my life. My apartment was central to my life. I was living, you know, in many ways, what's called the American dream. I had a goal of being a millionaire by the time I was 30, and I was actually on that path. Uh, I was running a marketing company that was doing really well. I had a, a hand, multiple handfuls of people who, who worked uh, for the company that I started. And uh, life was good. I had a lot of friends. Um, you know, I had a lot of romantic interests. I had uh, all the material possessions I wanted. I had... Um, I was exploring uh, and I was happy. Life was great. I had everything really to a large degree that I wanted and I was on track for getting what I wanted. But then I realized that I wanted to totally transform my life. I realized I didn't want to do it this way anymore and that there was actually a new path that I wanted. And so I had a pretty radical shift and what happened was I simply started to watch a lot of documentaries and read a lot of books. And I realized that the way that I was living, the American dream is actually the world's nightmare. I learned that the food that I was eating, the car I was driving, the gas I was pumping into the car, the cheap junk I was buying, the trash I was creating, even the water that I was drinking was causing destruction to the earth, was destroying plants and animals that I love was a part of great inequity and great um, destruction of humanity, of, of my fellow humans that I share this earth with. And I just learned that there was so much lies and deceit behind my actions. And I said to myself, I don't want to partake in this anymore. I don't want to have the wool pulled over my eyes and I don't want to partake in the subliminal programming of other people doing it through my own actions. So I decided I was going to transform my life and take my life back one step at a time. Take it back from these corporations who had sold me that I needed them in order to be a happy, healthy, contributing member of society. Take it back from the government that you know held so many truths from the public and uh you know had so many agendas of wanting us to do things not for the best interest of all but for the best interest of the few the one percent or so and so that's what i did i set out to transform my life and um rather than feeling a lot of doom and gloom which i felt some it was heavy to learn that your life is a lie but for the most part, I felt inspired and excited because as I was learning the problems, I was also learning the solutions. I was watching solution-oriented films and reading solution-oriented books, and I learned that there is another way. And the way has been paved. I don't have to figure too much out. The information is out there. I just have to piece it together and figure out how it works for me. And so what I did is I made a list of over 100 changes I wanted to make in my life. And I made, um, I put that in my kitchen right by the front door where everybody who came over would see that list. And my goal was that I would pause, I would, I would check off 
one thing per week. I would make one positive change per week and I would check that off and I would bring, I would immerse in this journey and I'd bring others with me. And this was before I was using social media as a tool for change or anything. It was 2011. Um, so it was, uh, you know, very just me and the people around me. And then I was posting some online. And so that's what I did. One change a week for two years was my minimum. And the idea was if I did one change a week for two years, that's 104 positive changes. And that's a life transformation to be doing a hundred things different, a hundred core things in your life different. So that's what I did one step at a time from small things like, you know, not using plastic shopping bags or, um, or, you know, mi middle things like not going to Walmart anymore and instead like trying to buy things local to riding my bike more and driving the car less to, breaking free from alcohol and instead putting, you know, beverages into my body that nourish me rather than, you know, destroy me inside. And so there was so many small changes, the big changes. And, uh, you know, eventually a big change was getting rid of my car completely and going pedal power, just, you know, just riding my bike or, um, removing my money from the big banks and taking all of my money out of any investments that had fossil fuels, cigarettes, infrastructure projects, uh, and actually just pulling 100% of my investments out to invest in now. You know, the idea, well, what's more worth, what's, what's more valuable to me than clean air and water? I'm going to put all my resources into that now. So, we have a, a possibility for a future even. Money might not even exist when I'm 60. So why would I put all my money into this construct that I have no confidence is even going to be here? So the, the changes were, as you can hear, somewhat radical. You know, re-questioning everything and making both small changes to large changes. And then the other big piece of the puzzle is I started to really use this as activism to bring people along on this journey of living simply and sustainably and connected to earth, share my narrative as a human being that other people could say, I'm interested. I'm interested in the crazy things this guy is doing from biking across the country on a bamboo bicycle while having as close to no negative impact as possible to a month of living like the average person and wearing all of my garbage to traveling to far off countries with no money and having to travel home on the kindness of others, as well as my own resourcefulness skills and my ability to exist without money to um, living in a tiny house. That's, you know, 50 square feet in San Diego and then a hundred square feet in Orlando and growing and foraging a hundred percent of my food for an entire year to fully break free from the global industrial food system and see if it's possible um, these are the types of activism campaigns that I've been doing while focused on the deepest portion of my activism, which is just my life is my message. I do these extreme projects, but also my life is the most extreme thing, existing outside of these societal structures while remaining in society to be a change maker for society. So... Uh, I think that summarizes uh, to a degree what I've been up to for the last decade or so as a human being and as a, um, a you know, change maker that I'm desiring to be. And my biggest passion is being of service to, to people who, you know, if somebody's not interested in living sustainably, then that's not really my focus of who to talk to. My focus is to Talk to the people who are just so eager to transform their lives. And, and even if it's, that's their first step, or for many of you, I'm sure you've taken quite a few steps. So like my best service that I can do here today is help you to take those further steps wherever you are in your journey to connect more deeply with the earth, to liberate yourself, to break free for more and with a big part of that being to live more simply and sustainably. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much.
Mm -hmm. beautiful response um yeah I, I was thinking a bit about um the money the money side of this we don't have a whole month that we kind of give over to exploring the economics of, of local place and how we can use that as a as a way of connecting but I'm, I'm really interested in that and i remember hearing at some point some investment advice come back saying don't think about sort of where to put your money in the normal ways actually just plug it all back into that community that you live in in whatever way if it was like the biggest gift to that community and trust that in the strangest and most unpredictable ways that you'll get returns and you know those returns will be in the form of a, a, a stronger community or a, a abundant orchard or all of these other possibilities so i think we'll we will create space uh, in the coming months to explore kind of local economics a little bit more as well and yeah i, I guess voluntary simplicity as a as mm -hmm. a way of connecting to, to the local landscape and community mm -hmm. um i'd love to hand i've got a list of questions but i'd love to hand it over to um to anyone who who does have a question um so i'll just sort of open the floor and you can raise your hands in whatever way feels good sure very excited to hear the questions that people have and uh, i'll just give a little preface and say that no question is off the table no question is too weird in fact the more unusual i appreciate <laughs> Great. I'm going to skip down to question 87. <laughs> uh, Juliet's got her, her hand up. Go for it, Juliet. Hi, Robin. Hi, everyone. Um, what was the most challenging change that you made that you found the hardest? Sure. Um, you know, th there is no most challenging change that I made because this is it's always a challenge and you know what's hardest is less so making the change but maintaining the change it's often and it's what i've seen so con so consistently in my colleague circle as a lot of my friends who are pretty dedicated to uh you know environmental issues and living it and then five years later it's like whoa what happened like all of a sudden they've got this corporate job and um and they're not really doing it anymore. Um, maybe they had kids uh, and, and that ended up being a, a really um, substantial amount of their time. So I would say the biggest thing, the most challenging thing versus any individual change is the maintenance, the, the continuation, because our society is designed not for living in harmony with the earth. Our, design, our society is designed to continuously pillage and destroy in a delusional manner where we don't see it we don't see the truth behind our actions and so i what i what i feel is that often amongst society we're going against the grain of society on a daily basis we're moving against the grain of society to simply try to exist in a happy healthy sustainable you know regenerative manner and so main, maintenance is 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 one of the biggest challenges. And then the other aspect, um, you know, a, you, a lot of people in this sort of sustainability movement, um, you'll see kind of like simplified, like, okay, just make these changes and you'll live sustainably. But for me, it's, it's our minds. Our minds are number one. Because once we liberate our minds, the actions will come. A liberated mind doesn't do the things anymore that they know. <laughs> are not in alignment with their truest self. Once we're fully liberated, so much just flows. That said, for me, what I did is I did make a lot of physical changes in my life that created the liberation, that created the confidence, that created the new systems around me, that created the new friends around me, that made it, that, that helped with that mental liberation, which helped with the change and so it's all connected you know the 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 actual making of the changes and then the actual changing of the mind doing both of those things at once support each other and, and move us forward but the biggest challenge to start it, what i've found is it's not the any of the individual actions in them in of them in and of themselves it's the societal concepts around them it is how are people going to perceive me doing this? And for some people, it's as simple as being concerned about like bringing their own bag to the grocery store because they live in a town where even that is like, 
you know, making a bit of a scene and people are like, what are you, what, what are you doing? You're different. And in a society where, you know, it's kind of monoculture where it's like, just be like everyone else. But then it can be like, you know, the sort of other things like just wearing different clothes, smelling different, uh, having different body hair, you know, getting your body around in different ways, like a bicycle or walking versus a car, et cetera. And so that would be, I think the, the really biggest thing is the, the society, breaking free from the societal structures and finding the mental liberation and the confidence to be able to say, you know what, I'm gonna do things my way. And, and uh, my way is one where I'm gonna pay attention to, are my actions in harmony? The way I started out was I would, I would question every action. I'd say, is this beneficial to the earth? my community and myself. That was the new lens in the way that I decided whether or not I would take an action. Rather than how does this look to society, it's is this beneficial to the earth, my community and myself. Now I will answer, I guess, because I do like to really direct people's an uh, directly answer people's questions. I can say one of the things that was the most challenging and that was getting rid of my cell phone. That took me about four or five years, but it was huge. And it was, it was uh, at the beginning, never knew that it would be possible. Never had a hard time perceiving that I could exist without a cell phone. And it's been like seven years now without a cell phone. And uh, but that was one of the biggest things. That was also my last bill to my name. And, and that, was a, that was a big deal to, to break free from the cell phone. Wonderful. Thank you for that answer. Um, oh, the screen is jumping around. I think um, Monica was uh, the next hand up. Monica, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi. Um... I'm a big fan. Um, I, I, I know you and, and your website and I've seen your Ted talk and, um, and you're a very inspirational, um, person. Um, my computer is going to die. So if you see me disappear, I'm so sorry, but I'll, I will catch the recording. Um, and I hope to get an answer to this quick question on, well, it's, it's, it's just really, I'd love to hear your thoughts on living in community and whether or not like what what does society look like as as we move forward in a in a sustainable um in right relationship with the earth do you see it i mean I, as far as i know you don't live in a like a, a community right now you're on your right. own um, yes. and whether you see that as um a sustainable model or i think one of my biggest hesitations is um or my, my husband and I is if we get together with a bunch of friends and then there's all this drama and we don't get along and now we've invested in all of this, we're used to having the freedom of just, you know, being who we are. Um, so I, if you could talk a little about what you think about communities or yes. versus living independently. Yeah, thanks for asking, Monica, and thanks for sharing. Um, my answer to this is very simple. I don't think we have a way forward as a humanity if we don't live in community. I, I, or sh I, shall I say, we don't have a we don't have a, a sustainable future if we don't learn to live in community. In my opinion, it's the separation from one another that is, and at the same time, the separation between us and other species and with the Earth, which is at the very core of what. I think would be our potential demise as a humanity and, and is a part of our current demise as a humanity. Um, separating out all of these tasks into making it so that each one of us needs to do each one of them every single day is incredibly ineffective and it's exactly what capitalism wants. That way we are completely dependent upon money and that means we're completely dependent upon these corporations. We've lost our power. Community is what gives us our power back, because even if we theoretically want to do all of this as an individual, it's exhausting and it's barely even to it's it's like the concept of working 40 hours a week and having time to really live connected to the earth and to people and such is it's it seems like nearly impossible to take it to that level. So community is the answer. 
sharing meals, sharing lodging, sharing chores, sharing uh, child raising, uh, sharing resources is absolutely answer. And so it's kind of interesting that I personally haven't lived in community, given that I'm saying so strongly that that is the answer. And it was just a couple days ago that I said to myself, I think the next place I'm living is to be in community. I, I, I really, as I'm more and more wanting to, as I'm more and more wanting to break free, I'm seeing I, I need to, in order to accomplish that, become a bit more dependent upon a close knit group of people. See, the difference for me is that I have a huge community that supports me and loves me. And, you know, for a lot of people that are on this movement, they don't have that. I talk to a lot of people who are lonely and who are trying to live this life, but they don't have the support. I, I, uh, live in community in the sense that everywhere I go, there's somebody who will take me in and every need that I have is met and I meet other people's needs. So I have, I have created this interesting way of living in community in my life. Um, but I also do live a very, uh, in many ways, individualistic life. And I personally like to be alone a lot. So the last thing I'll say to it is um, that I see for, for me personally and, and for a lot of people like you, you know, you mentioned you and your partner liking to have things your way. Um, I see one really beautiful way of doing it is where you have community, where you have your own tiny houses and your own, your own space where you have that independence. And then you have your communal spaces where you have your communal kitchen and your all of your communal resources. And you are able to go down there as much or as little as needed. And you come up with um, you come up with a balance. And that's the way that I would potentially like to do it. Just have my own simple little space that I have the ability to nest away in just as I desire. And then to be able to go into the space and return as needed. And so two of the most practical notes that I'll say along those lines is that I do, uh, I've visited communities and I have a lot of friends who are involved in communities and such. And the number one reason they fail is exactly what you uh, are concerned about and that's getting along. And um, so knowing that going in is key, that the hardest part about community is getting along with one another. And in my opinion, the hardest about being a human is getting along with other humans. And so my uh, most liberating thing has been uh, compassionate communication or nonviolent communication. I've been immersed in that for three years. It's revolutionized my, revolutionized my life. Um, I consider the nonviolent communication book to be my Bible, basically. I am preaching this stuff because I'm seeing it transforming the lives of so many around me. Um, so immersing in it. So a lot of us are probably advocates for psilocybin or meditation, uh, deep meditation. I consider uh, compassionate communication to be like psilocybin for the mind, but through conscious communication, through reprogramming our thoughts, which is exactly what psilocybin and a lot of these plant medicines do is they reprogram our minds. And that's exactly what nonviolent communication or compassionate communication has the potential to do which is reprogram our minds. And it's an incredible tool for living in community. And I would now say I am much more capable of living in community after having immersed in practicing compassionate communication, because I, it's all about freeing your own mind. Once, once you take full responsibility that every feeling that you have is a feeling that was created inside of yourself, it's pretty hard to get annoyed anymore because you realize nothing can annoy you. Only you can annoy yourself. It changes things. Brilliant answer. Really enjoyed that. Thank you. I think I need to get that book. Yeah. <laughs> I live in a, I live in a community that sounds quite a lot like what you described and um, yeah, there is the communication is an absolute key to it functioning, you know, 
from the outside it's this really perfect space and we have our own houses communal kitchen and, but it's the, the complication absolutely is is how do we all come to agree on the things that need to be decided on as a community yeah thank you for that thanks for the yeah. question monica yeah um ish i think you were next hand up you go ahead if you want hi robin thank you so much uh for your presence uh your wonderful presence and being here and sharing um your experiences with us uh, i can't wait to use that bit about nothing can annoy you apart from yourself, you yourself it's, that's great um I actually had two questions, one which is connected to what you were just talking about, uh, community. Um, my first question was around uh, when, as and when you started making these changes in your lives, um, it, what happened to your relationships um, and how did those change? Because oftentimes, a, a lot of the times, uh, for me, uh, big changes have been difficult or delayed because of this consideration of relationships and, and the impact it has on them. Um, so that's one question. And the second question is, um, how did your conversation with yourself change over the period mm -hmm. of transformation? Because like you said, the mind is really where it all starts and, and it comes from. And I think our conversations uh, with ourselves have a big role uh, to play in the transformations we experience. Um, so it would be really amazing if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks for asking, Ish. Appreciate those questions. Um, and also, Monica, I'm so glad that I was able to answer the question before your computer died. I'm so glad that that worked out. Um, so as far as my relationships, they did change. And to, I'm going to try to give the shorter end answer to this because I could dive into so many like niches of this. But um, a couple things. One is that I said to I, ha I had to give the honest, ask the honest question. And then that is what is this relationship truly serving me and the other person in the relationship? And there were many times where I said, no, like the reason for having this relationship would just be holding on to something. Um, it's not this relationship is not needed by me nor them. Part of the way that I look at it is that I, I am developing universal love where, and the idea of universal love in part is that you aren't attached to the particular love of any one person and that you instead embrace the family of 8 billion people that we have, which I know that this can sound cliche and even unattainable, but I am 100% of the belief that it is possible to equally love all of the 8 billion as you would your mother or your sibling or your daughter or, or, or son. I truly believe that. And part of the reason that I believe that is because I've seen the shift that I've had in going from a more singular love of being so, it being so important to be loved by one. For me, I'm attracted to women as far as romance. And so to go from where I needed that one love in order to have my sense of belonging and, and um, you know, acknowledgement met to, I don't really need that anymore. Um, you know, I've been, for the last 16 months or so, I've practiced not being in romantic relationships, but I'm in love. <laughs> I, I, I am genuinely in love with humanity and, my love for humanity has increased because I'm not putting my energy into, into the area of a few, a few relationships. And where our energy goes, that's what the energy that comes back to us, where our attention is, that's what we're going to get out of life. And so, um, so, so basically I have let go of a lot of relationships. I deleted my personal Facebook profile and I cried actually because i let go of a lot of friendships like i knew that those 700 people well it used to be 5000 and i got it down to 700 and that was 700 people that i knew who they were and they knew who i was and i deleted it and that i i cried numerous times and i didn't expect that but it was like heavy it was heavy to let go of so much and 
Um, my belief is that to get what we want, we have to let go of a lot because what we want is a lot and there's only so much space in our lives. My belief is that there's only so much space in my life and I have to make conscious choices, diligent choices. And so that means letting go of what no longer serves and serves me and serves the greater humanity and serves my community. Um, so, I've let go of a lot of relationships and some of my relationships have become much stronger. My mother and I have the strongest relationship we've ever had um, because of actually large, largely because of compassionate communication, like learning how to communicate with one another. Um, but my dad, for example, I let go uh, because that relationship wasn't serving and, and me and my dad uh, are very much hardly in each other's lives. We, we talk a little bit and I keep things positive, but that was a relationship that I had to let go because the energy to go in, going into it was not of service to myself, to him or uh, uh, to humanity. So, um, and then the other part is that uh, just again, remembering there's 8 billion people out there. There's 8 billion potential friends. If I lose a friend, it's like, well, I'm not attached to that exact individual when there's 8 billion of us. And it, same goes for if anybody doesn't like me, it's like, well, there's 7 billion people who can like me. So that doesn't really matter. Um, I guess I do want to give a large um, sort of asterisk to that and say that I have a lot of privilege uh, in the life that I'm living. And I, I, so I have the privilege of being able to step away from relationships more easily um, I also grew up with a family that was never the most connected. So it's also much easier for me. Um, also have a family that doesn't really expect. They, we haven't ever been told we have to do anything or be a certain way. And so I have, a, it's a lot easier for me. Um, it's a lot, what I've just described is a lot easier for me than what a lot of people have as far as the foundations with, with, within their lives. And then as far as the second question goes, how do I speak to myself? Um, I mentioned compassionate communication. And so the word communication, you generally people are going to assume that you're going to be speaking to someone when you're communicating. But the heart of communication is what's going on inside of our minds first, because we have to have a thought before we can communicate that thought with someone else. It arises in our mind before we can then bring it to someone else's mind. And so the most foundational element of communication is indeed the communication we're having with ourselves. If we do not, if we do not deeply self-observe, self if we do not deeply self-analyze our own communication, we can never expect to have the communication that we want to have with others. We just, we just will never have the communication we truly want to have with others unless we can have it with ourselves first. It's the exact same concept with we'll, we'll never have a flowing, healthy relationship with our partner if we're miserable inside. We need to find happiness within in order to find happiness in our relationships. And so the way in which we speak, the way in which I speak to myself is at the heart of my ability to speak to others. And so for me, that's truth. That's uh, seeking truth in everything that I do. Um, integrity, finding integrity within, in my thoughts, in my words, in my actions bringing those into my relationships, finding peace within. If I enter, one of the things that I love that Thich Nhat Hanh says is that if there's a lifeboat of, of like, let's say 30 people and it's complete chaos and like the chaos is about to sink the, sh the lifeboat and everybody, everybody will die. And one person can just be operating from a place of such peace that they speak and everybody calms down and the boat doesn't sink, that's what the internal peace can bring to our relationships. So imagine if that internal peace is what we're bringing to all of our relationships and all of our conversations, whether we even say a word or not. So it all goes back to Gandhi's saying, be the change you wish to see. If we focus on being the change we wish to see, 
we'll find that more in our relationships. I personally am a believer of, of creating change at all levels. So you need top down and bottom up happening at the same time. You need the corporate change, the individual change, the government change, et cetera. But I believe that the only thing that I can control is my thoughts and my actions, my mind. The only thing I can guarantee to master is my own mind, not somebody else's actions. And so I am of the belief, and, and I've learned from the people that I look to the most, you know, Mahatma Gandhi being an example of that, um, or like Satish Kumar, you know, it's people who focus on themselves as their means of change first and foremost while going outside of themselves as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. Ronnie, did you want to say something? You looked like you were reaching for the mute. No, no, that's just me changing the um the view for the recording. <laughs> mm. Beautiful, Robin. Thanks so much for that answer. I'm really reminded we've, we've been exploring, uh, we're using kind of deep ecology as a bit of a framing for this whole program. And so we're exploring this concept of the ecological self quite a lot. And what you spoke to there really, really embodies that idea of a, a, a well-expanded ecological self that really encompasses yeah, all of humanity, all of the ecologies into this sense of, of our self with this goal of becoming a person that, that their actions are of benefit to that wider ecological community, which we see as interwoven and interconnected. So it's really beautiful to hear it from that perspective of, yeah, loving, loving 8 billion people. Nice. Well, yeah, what a beautiful, beautiful goal. Um, well, that's my goal. My, so the theory that I have, the idea that I have, and this is not easy to accomplish, but we have all of these, we have all of the, like, we have all these conversations that are like incredibly exciting and like radical and like far outside of the mainstream society. And like, we know that's what we want. So I'm the experiment that I'm really starting to focus on this year is like, how can I live that? We talk about it and we have these like revolutionary thought people that I learn from. And I'm like, how can I live that to such an extent that I'm able to speak upon these topics from a place of experience? And that's an experiment because that's taken it to another level. And I've, I have taken it to that level in certain ways already with like, you know, existing with, with uh, very little money and be, being dependent upon humanity in a society that says you should be an individual I've taken it to, to already some degrees, but that's my goal of the next couple of years is like, how can I take these concepts of what we are trying to experience as this new, as this humanity moving forward and embody them in a way that brings them to real life? Mm -hmm. I'm so excited to, to continue to witness that unfold, Robin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mark, did you want to did you want to ask a question? Hi, yeah, thank you. Hi, Robin. Hi, um, and thank you for those answers so far. It's been uh, um, really interesting and helpful. Yeah, um, yeah. What um, what I wanted to ask, um, and if it, this feels a little bit tangled, it might come out easily. It might not. Uh, so we we've personally made quite a lot of changes we've been on quite a journey as well in the last few years probably probably the last decade um so not dissimilar to yourself um um we one of the things we did we started um an ethical small business uh just well five and a half years ago and that's great and it's built like a lovely community around us we we own and run a um a whole foods refill organic fruit and veg shop so it's built a lovely community around us and um that's been really really positive but um i also feel in two camps i kind of feel that means i have to have connections with social media with at times like this, which are a bit more financially difficult in the business world in the UK, where I've got to 
push that a little bit more and maybe ask our community for a bit more and it feels like i you know the the technology that i really would like to leave behind um and the necessity of providing for my family we've got two young children as well mean that i kind of feel torn between two camps and it and it often feels like that like you know this wonderful course came along and it felt like exactly the right thing for me at the right time but then i feel ah oh, i can't forget about this over here i can't take my eye off that i've got to give that some of my attention and there are times where i really don't want to give that my attention and i feel like i can forget about all the good things that we've done over the last few years like they cumulatively have added up to where we are but i kind of can't feel all those things now this is just our normal life yeah. and there are so many local issues that you know want want to sort of pull my attention away that we could get involved in some of those are quite personally difficult you know there's potentially a housing development on the end of, edge of our village and i feel like i just there's just too much to do you know and sometimes i want to push forwards and sometimes i just want to retreat and forget about the whole thing so i just wondered there you go that was a big question i just wondered sure. whether you got any advice for living in that sort of space really sure well i can share that i've experienced everything that you've just shared except i haven't had kids but you know as far as all of the mindset behind it and the pull in different directions and not knowing what to do and the, the level of balance of technology, whether to use it or not to use it. Like it's all things that I have experienced and still am experiencing in my life. Um, and I still am involved in money in certain ways. I run a nonprofit. Um, so, you know, money, money plays, plays a role and it's, and, and I will say that money is the most challenging way in which you can still get live the exact life you want money tends to be the thing that pulls you from living the life that you truly dream. Cause it's like, well, we need, I want, I want that, but we need this. Like we, right now we need enough money to do this. So it's like, well, all right, what do we got to do in order to get that? So I, I definitely hear and uh, what you're sharing and experience it myself. Um, so I, I guess a couple thoughts on that. One, and you did hit on this, is, is remembering to be grateful for what we have. And I know, again, I, I, I think I mentioned things being cliche, but uh, gratitude is the number one medicine that I know of. Uh, there is no medicine more powerful in my life than gratitude. Up there is fresh, clean water from Lake Superior. It's healthy food straight from the garden. It's uh, breathing. It's having deep connection with community and friends. But I don't know if any of them are as powerful as gratitude because you actually don't need to have anything, not even food, to have gratitude. Gratitude is something that's in our mind. And when we're grateful, and we focus, if we only focus on what we're grateful for, then life is wonderful. And when we focus on what 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 we're not happy with, then, then we can be living a nightmare or we can be living a blissful dream with nothing else changing around us whatsoever except our mind. And so remembering that, I think practices of like reminding yourself of where you got to, I, I am always remembering, well, just think, imagine, I could still be living the delusional life I was 10 years ago. And if I remember that every day, then every day is something to celebrate. So, um, and celebrating life. That's a, that's been my, my five pillars are mindfulness, presence, gratitude, celebration of life and empathy. Those are the five pillars that I've decided to try to bring into everything I do. All of them being things that I needed to work on. And so incorporating them in gratitude, mindfulness, presence, celebration of life and empathy. And so I see all of those as helpful, you know, in, in what you have just described, like all of those uh, would be helpful in that scenario. Um, so that's one thing is gratitude. 
And then the other thing is taking the time to really strategize your life. The reality is, is that like, we have to come to the terms that, that we are not able to do everything that we want to do. And if we continue to try to do everything that we want to do, we will never be doing what we want to do because we will be spread thin and we won't be enjoying what we're doing. <laughs> and I've lit, I can say this from experience. I've spent a lot of years trying to do way too much and not enjoying what I'm doing in the moment that could be the most enjoyable thing on earth in that moment, but instead it's a chore. And so, um, you know, another practice is like really like making a list of every, I do this all the time. I make a list of everything that I'm doing. Um, I have these, I have this notebook and I'm, I'm constantly making like lists of uh, like this, this list is what brings me the most joy. And, and so like I make these lists and I use them as the foundation of my life. And I have to say this thing I'm doing, I can't do this anymore and still do this. So like really being diligent about prioritizing and planning our lives. Of course, if you don't do that, it's unlikely you'll ever get what you want. If you don't plan and prioritize, it's unlikely you'll ever get the life that you want. So now that I'm saying this, it's like, of course we need to do that. But there's so many of us that aren't doing that. <laughs> we don't take the time to sit down and really do that because uh, one, we haven't been taught to do that. And two, society is intentionally makes us so busy that we don't even have the time to do that. And thus we spin on the hamster wheel or the rat race for our entire lives, never able to figure out what we really want. Um, so yes, I think being really intentional, taking the time and, and, um, and making those lists and continuously finessing them, like making that, sometimes I'll make that same list three months later without looking at the old list and see if I came up with the exact same stuff or not. Um, so making it an intentional practice. Um, and I, uh, the last little note that I'll say is, again, community. The more that we can lean into community and make things a communal effort, the, the more that this stuff, uh, you know, whether it's the business or like the raising of the family together, um, the more that we can bring in community, the more that it has the potential for us to have that, that time, because time is one of our most limited resources so yeah there's so much more that i can say on that but i hope that those were some helpful thoughts yeah thank you thanks robin yeah you're welcome mark do we have is it just one more question that we have time for yeah so yeah really wanting to honor your time robin so if you happy to take one more question that would be great nikki's uh nikki's hands up and yeah and then we can then we can come to a close thanks so much there you are nikki go for it hi robin hey nikki um, I've definitely heard your name before and heard some of your story, but I'm not super familiar with it. Um, so maybe you've already answered this somewhere. I was reading your website earlier today, but it always seems like to start living in a way that's more off grid or more aligned with the earth or with your purpose that everyone I talked to that's doing it first started in the corporate world and had a ton of money. And then were able to just go off, and do their own thing after that. And for people that are maybe more middle or lower class, I don't know how to get out of that kind of rat race or you know get off the hamster wheel um, to start something like that, to work with the land more with, without the tools or the money to buy the tools or, and I'm not sure how you did it or how you got to that point but i really feel like everyone i talked to is like yeah i had to save a ton of money working in finance and then like totally changed my mind about what i want to do with my life um and maybe that'll be a quick maybe that's a quick answer for you yeah. and i had another question about creativity because it also seems like as humans we want to create and so really reducing our impact on the earth um it seems like creativity how do you create them like artists that want to paint and things like that but i don't know if we'll have time for that type of question which was my original question but the first question is more 
something I'm curious about because yeah. I don't run into a lot of people who are like, yeah, I just did this. <laughs> So yeah, oh, I hear it's, it's interesting to but, hear that the general narrative that you've heard has been of people who had a substantial amount of money and then choosing to live sustainably because I have heard that narrative quite a few times. The good news is, is that is just one of the, that's just one of the narratives. That's just one of the demographics of people that, that uh, break free. The reality is, is that um, it's, it's millions of people from all walks of life. Many people living this life never got indoctrinated. They, they never bought into it all and they never had much money and they've always lived simply. They're not the ones who you're gonna hear media about because their lives are not considered cool and sexy. Um, but there's a lot of people who are living sim you know, voluntary simplicity. It's at the core of their being and it always has been. Their parents were living it and so they are, you know, that's, that's one group of people. You also have like the more time that I have broken free from um, I, the more time that I have started to immerse myself in different communities, the more that I've seen the same narrative happening throughout different communities of race um, and uh, you know, economic status and, and things along those um, things along those lines. What did you say? I guess I should have specified people on Western culture have to rule. Yeah. So with, and that's even within the Western culture, still what I am sharing applies. So like, for example, I used to believe that the environmental movement was created by, um, by the white environmental group that you see. It's not true at all. It's just, that's what you see in the media. The environmental movement was mostly created from what I can tell actually out of black and indigenous led resistance to Western imperialism and um, capitalism that was taking over their, their basic rights. So I think a big part of it is just a matter of what narrative we see out there versus what's actually going on out there. There are a lot of people but I will say having the privilege and having the resources does make it a lot easier to break free. If you're working two jobs just to try to meet ends meet, having the time to ha even think about li liberating yourself is very challenging. So I definitely want to acknowledge the privilege it, that makes it a lot easier and more accessible. Um, and that in these like, socioeconomic classes, there's often even stronger stigmas against choosing um, simplicity. I've seen that, like I have a lot of friends that are black and I am involved in black communities. And to them, it's like, why the heck would you choose to have less money? We need money um, because they've needed it to prove that they're contributing value. Well, they've, they've needed it to prove that they are worthy human beings in the society that has said you're not enough. Uh, and not only are you not enough, that you're less of a human. And so there are bigger challenges to go up against even in some of these uh, groups of people. Like a lot of my black friends, it's like to, for them to be like, you know, living out of a backpack, their community is like, what is wrong with you? Like you have lost your mind. So it is a lot harder, but I do wanna say that I see it across I see it across and I have friends across the, the different spectrums. And so it is, it is doable. And so, um, you know, furthering and getting out there and, and uh, getting immersed in other communities, uh, I think makes, makes a difference with that. And one other little side note I want to say is that it is possible that I am wrong about everything that I've said today and that I'm actually living in an extreme state of delusion. Like it is, it is possible. And I just want to put that out there. I don't think that's the case. I think that there are things that are universal truths and that you learn these things that have been passed down over tens of thousands of years of, of universal truth. And that's where I gravitate towards. I don't think that the leaders that I have gravitated towards were living in delusion. These are the people who are seeking uh you know liberation of the mind but i still do want to say that it's possible that i am living in a state of delusion and that everything that i've said is misguiding towards uh towards the liberation of humanity i, I don't think so but it is possible um 
And then, so lastly, as far as the creativity part, uh, I do think creativity is important. Also will say, I'm very happy to share with you that it is possible to live the most utmost of creativity while not causing one ounce of destruction to earth, humanity, or our plants and animal relatives. And that creativity can come through the form of like using waste as your resources for creation. It can be using um, plants that are growing freely and abundantly as your medium for, you know, creation, whether that could be like jewelry or, uh, or it could be making art that's purely from that, that when you're done with it, you can return it. There's a lot of people that do temporary art where you create something and then you take it apart and you return it to the earth. The creativity can come through speaking. Your creativity could be purely through uh, through the words that come out of your mouth. Um, it could be through writing. Um, so there's so many ways in which to be creative, both in physical self. Your creativity could be dance, uh, for example, or playing a musical instrument. And then it's a matter of how you choose to spread it do you choose the mediums that are potentially having destructive elements or do you find ways to do it in which you don't need those mediums that are potentially destructive? So I'm excited to say that it is possible to be the most creative we've ever been while having no destruction and uh, purely a positive impact on the earth. Beautiful. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, Nikki, for that question as well. Um, does any anyone have any final thoughts, Ronnie? Anything that you want to bring to the space yeah, before I, we let Robin I, go? I just thought Ish said something interesting. Just this this notion of a contributing member of society um, basically invalidates any being that doesn't contribute in a specific way. Are you paying taxes? And yet they are the ones contributing in the most beautiful way, just with their presence. So, yeah love that and it kind of comes back to this idea of okay what are our vital needs what are we actually contributing towards and what are standards of living because we've got these like external measurements of what a human being should be doing that don't serve society at all and like you know it's being measured on breakdown ultimately so yeah really valid and um thank you all so much for such incredible questions or <laughs> you may say me. Um, I feel like we all could ask you so many questions. So hopefully the conversation can continue just through all the different mediums and ways we can stay connected with your work, Robin. But you're such an inspiration. Thank you so much for this time. Really, really Absolutely. grateful. I may as well put this out there right now, but I am potentially going to be walking from uh, um, Washington to um, to California this summer for three months. And I haven't put this out to many people, but it is going to be anybody could join and you could ask me all the questions you have as we're walking down the Pacific Coast Highway along the Pacific Ocean. Um, and basically that's part of what I'll be doing is just uh, asking, answering questions. And then at the same time in the months or in the months and the years ahead, my intention is to go places, like to sit at a park for a week and just anybody can come and we can talk, you know, and uh, I can help uh, with uh, these sorts of things. And so the opportunity will be there, especially in person. Um, but also I do try to answer questions on my social media. That said, I might be getting rid of my computer this year and not be online very much um, and have other people that are online helping spread the message, but the opportunities will be there. So definitely people watch for ways to get involved, whether in person or on the computer. And I thoroughly enjoyed sharing this with, sharing these thoughts with you. And I hope that it, it's been meaningful and I'm grateful for you all being here because I wouldn't be doing any of this as if it wasn't for community. I wouldn't have the support the motivation, the inspiration, the creativity, none of this would be here if we weren't here doing this together. So I'm grateful for this uh, time that we got to spend together today. Oh, I love that heart. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> Bless you, Robin. Oh, yeah, thank, you, thank so much. you so much. And I want to just quickly add, that is so creative. You know, the way you're sharing the message, that's such an expression of creativity that exploring you know how do we simplify and continue to be creative i think every single moment we're we're in creation mode are we co-creation mode with life um so yeah thank you so much okay. thank you everyone well, thank you very much mm. good luck on your trip robin enjoy okay. your walking <laughs>